my husband Jay, who's back there, and I moved here in 1970, and we didn't know a soul. I mean, no relatives, no friends. His office was in our house. I was still going to the university to finish school. We had no contacts here, and we were living over in uh, Gateway Gardens on the southwest side so that I could get to and from the university more quickly. And we had lived here for, I don't know, maybe a couple of months, and I was feeling like I had been sent to Siberia. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up outside of Chicago, and Jay came from Kansas City, and so, you know, we just didn't know anybody in Iowa. I'd never been to Iowa. And so um, I went home one day at one, and was there for over a weekend and uh, saw one of my grandmothers, and I was complaining about how, oh my gosh, I didn't know anybody, it was really boring, I didn't, I mean, what the heck? And she just, who was one of my best mentors of my life, just loved my grandmother, um, she looked at me and she said, if you think people are gonna beat a path to your door, you are dead wrong. Get up off your butt, get out and get involved in the community. And I thought, well, huh, that wasn't very sympathetic. <laughs> and so I went home and I felt sorry for myself for another couple of weeks and then I thought, hmm, I'm gonna show her. <laughs> so at that point, the Gazette had, uh, in every week they would have a list of all the organizations that were meeting and the people who were organizing them and where they were and what time and all that kind of stuff. So I started looking through the paper to see if I could find things to do. And we didn't have any children, I was still going to school, it was, uh, you know, and I find, found some things that sounded interesting and so I contacted people and started slowly but surely getting involved in the community. And um, I finished school uh, as a teacher and I went to uh, work at Linmar and taught English for a while and then got pregnant and unexpectedly had twins. And this is in 1974 and I thought, there is no way on God's green earth that I'm gonna get them ready and me ready and be at school by 7.30 in the morning. So I became an at-home mom. And um, I don't know how many of you either have had multiple births or know of people that have had multiple births, but I'll tell you, having twins was a nightmare. <laughs> I can remember one time that I had them, they didn't have twin things then, and so Jay, Jerry rigged a couple of umbrella strollers with this little cross piece and you had to wing nut them together and, and you'd go down the sidewalk like this. And, and one day I, um, I had had it, just had it, I, they, were, they were just crying, didn't know why, I threw them both in the stroller. I'm, going down the sidewalk like this, <laughs> thinking, this, I can't believe this is happening, why me? And, and this woman stops and said, these are the most beautiful babies I've ever seen. <laughs> and for like two nanoseconds, I thought, well, thank you very much. And then I thought, but it's a damn life sentence. <laughs> so it was about that time that I decided, for my own self-preservation, I needed to be more involved in the excuse me, in the community, and just to get out every once in a while. Jay had a job where he was gone a lot, he traveled a lot, and so I was this sort of single at home mom a lot, and I needed to have something that got me out of the house, but that wasn't full time, because with two little babies, it just, we would have all been dead by the, you know, <laughs> end of the year. So I started doing a lot of volunteer work, and I was really, really fortunate in, in, um, in being able and having the opportunities that I had. And I did an enormous amount of volunteer work, as you saw on my resume. Um, uh, and I also was very uh, fortunate in that once I got into organizations as a volunteer, I then started serving on boards of directors, I then started serving as, um, board presidents, and the more I did, the more I learned above and beyond the um, uh, English education that I had, I was an English teacher, uh, about organizations and organizational development. And 
um, leadership and all of those uh, really important things for people who are going to be able to lead organizations into the future. And I just, at a, at a relatively young age, I had some really significant leadership opportunities which um, allowed me to grow and learn and uh, get skills that I never would have had otherwise uh, if I had just gone in and kept teaching. And so I got to learn a lot about the community um, that, I, that I had grown to love. Didn't think of it as, you know, being in Siberia anymore. And um, I had, we had grown to love it. We ended up having another child, so we had three boys. And um, it, it just gave me the freedom to be involved in the community, to have a, a professional, semi, I mean, semi-professional, if you want to call volunteers professional, professional experiences, and also uh, to learn a lot, uh, but also have the flexibility to be with the kids when I needed to, especially after they got into school, and um, you know, then I could really, really be involved uh, during the day. And it just, it was the most wonderful way to, to have a career. So here's where my resume and Lee's resume com converge. We both very briefly taught English at the beginning of our careers. She parlayed it into a career of leadership and service, and I parlayed it into a career in middle management. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's talk about the Renaissance Group. Would you say that that, how does the Renaissance Group fall into your path toward city leadership? Once I decided to go back to work, I, um, I had a very varied uh, professional career as well. I became a realtor. I was in commercial and, and residential real estate for a couple of years, and then I went to um, the uh, Kirkwood Community College, and I did business and industry training, and really enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun. At the same time I was doing that, I was a volunteer with the downtown district before it became the Renaissance Group, and they did they did not have any professional staff, and so it was all run by volunteers. And um, it was a pretty complex organization because they, the um, downtown uh, property owners had uh, passed their own business improvement tax, which is why it was called a Schmid or self-supporting improvement district, municipal improvement district. And so they were gathering additional taxes uh, to help improve the downtown. And um, volunteers trying to run that was, it was really kind of tough. And so as a, as a group, the volunteers, um, I was in charge of downtown development, economic development, and somebody else was in charge of programs and somebody else was in charge. So we had a board, and the board decided to hire uh, an, an executive director for the first time. And um, I really, really had enjoyed working as a volunteer for that, and so I applied, and I was chosen. So um, I became the first executive director of what then became known as the Renaissance Group, and we had a blast. I mean, it was really fun. We did a lot of um, a lot of things in the downtown, including the sculpture on Second Street. I don't know if you remember that, where we had uh, <coughs> sculptors bring pieces in, and they were there for two years, and then they uh, transferred out, and you could purchase them. They were all for sale. Uh, we did. Um, um, Taste of Iowa, which was the first time we had done anything in the downtown big music food event and uh, closed the streets and, and just had a ball doing that. But we also were very serious about making downtown something other than um, what it used to be, which was a retail center. And when Armstrong's and Killian's ended up closing, it was sort of the demise of all the rest of the retail in the downtown, and we, we needed to figure out how we were going to keep downtown viable because the downtown property comprises a huge percentage of, of property taxes for this community. And so we needed to make sure that downtown stayed very viable because it, it helped not only our group, but the community as well. And so we um, uh, uh, continued the Schmid tax and kept doing improvements in the downtown. And um, because of that, I was a quasi-public employee, 
I, not, not a public employee, but I did report directly to the mayor because of the taxes that were gathered. And so I had to, um, I had firsthand knowledge of how the, the council was working at the time, and it wasn't very effectively. Uh, we had a council that was, um, there was a lot of unrest, and they were at each other's throats a lot, and it, and it was really annoying because they weren't getting much done. Um, and I think you all probably remember that the, we had a commission form of government at the time. So uh, everybody on the council ran for a specific position on the council, and they were both policymakers and managers. And um, they weren't working very well together. And it was uh, so bad that the mayor at the time, Mayor Serbisek, decided he was not going to run for re-election. And the Parks Commissioner, Dave Kramer, said he wasn't going to run for re-election. And um, Lyle Hansen, who was the Finance Commissioner, and J.D. Smith, who was the Safety Commissioner, both decided they were going to quit their positions and run for mayor. Now, mayor was the only position on the council that was perceived as being sort of a generalist position. Everything else, you really kind of had to have a background in public safety or finance or engineering or whatever to be perceived as qualified to, to run for those posi positions on the council. And I kept waiting and waiting for somebody to come forward and run against these two guys. I ended up being actually friends with Lyle Hansen, but I thought the two of them were the worst offenders in this not inability to get along, and they weren't going to be a very good leader of the community if one of them uh, won. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, waiting. <laughs> Nobody well, else came. You, you waited till your husband was out of town. I did. <laughs> I. W I waited until he was out of town because I knew what he would say if I told him I was thinking about running. Anyway, I, um, I did call him and he was on a golf trip <laughs> with his buddies <laughs> and I caught him in the car and I said, well, guess what? And he said, no, what? And I said, well, I'm going to run for mayor. And you should have heard the stuff going on in the background when he said that. Anyway, I. Um, I did wait until the last minute. I was waiting for somebody else. At, but I did have a rather high profile in the community at the time because of my work with Renaissance Group and a lot of the work that I had done as a volunteer over the years. And um, so I ended up winning. And it was one of those things where you, you get to the end of the campaign and you've won and you go, oh, yeah, I've won. And then you go, holy what just happened? What do I do now? I mean, I was scared to death. And not only that, but Nancy Evans had run for safety commissioner, and the two of us were the first women to ever serve on the city council. Ever. Ever. It was 1996. What's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, but we were pretty young. I mean, I was, we were both 47. And, um, that is pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it, it was a real experience, and four out of the five of us were new to the council. Only, there was only one holdover, uh, Don Thomas, who was the streets commissioner, and he had only been there for two years. And uh, the rest of us, it was Nancy Evans, Ole Munson, and Chip Hughes, um, did I get through? ME. And I decided uh, before we took office that we were going to do some team building. And we were going to figure out how each other did problem solving and how we came to our decisions and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we went out to Kirkwood and had um, a trainer take us through this whole process. Did two days of training and team building and were roundly criticized by the media for having it closed. But we were not public in the public yet. We weren't public figures yet. We were just elected. And I thought it was important for us to be able to take the time to get to know each other because I did not want to see what happened with the immediate past council. I wanted us to be able to figure out how to get along and work together. 
The interesting thing about a commission form of government is that it's very much in silos. So you have uh, public safety over here, you know, and police and fire and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm, I was not only the mayor, but I was the commissioner of public affairs. And it meant that I had nine departments that reported directly to me. The, de the departments had never really worked with each other, ever. And so during that team building time, we, we kind of thought about how, how are we gonna make this better? How can, we, how can we improve, how can we allow these wonderful uh, city employees to do an even better job than they were already doing? And um, we came up with a lot of ideas, but one of the most fun ones was um, Nancy Evans came up with the idea of a competition that we were gonna have between the departments. And that, that the departments were going to tell us, the council, how, in what ways they could work together across department. And it was really interesting to see what some of the departments came up with. And the winner every month got Nancy Evans parking space at City Hall. <laughs> and so it was, it was kind of a matter of pride, a badge of honor to be able to park in the commissioner's parking spot. And um, so we had things like that. Um, the other thing that I always did every year was there was a, um, what they called a snowplow rodeo. And all of the, all of the drivers of snowplows throughout the entire, across, across the departments, no matter what department they were in, if they were in Parks and Rec, or if they were in the engineering department, or if, uh, streets department, whatever, if they were gonna drive a snowplow, they had to go through this rodeo that was set up out at Kingston Stadium parking lot. And it was um, really a, like an obstacle course. And so there was a mailbox over here, and there were some garbage cans over there, and cone, you know, orange cones here. And, and you had to maneuver these big trucks. I mean, some of them were huge, big trucks around this course. And if you couldn't do it in X number of minutes without hitting Y number of obstacles, then you had to go back to school <laughs> how to be a snowplow driver. And so every year I decided I was gonna go do that. And uh, every year I got the same driver who would sit next to me as I'm driving and give me all the instructions on how to do it, how to get through it. I have to tell you that I never hit any obstacles, but I was the slowest driver <laughs> of all time. It would have taken me three days to do somebody's street. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't do that. Well, and that's not the only driving you did as mayor. You went out to the racetrack, too, right? Oh, yeah. I had a couple of really fun experiences uh, doing things I'd never done before, one of which was drag racing. Art Christofferson um, was actually, he was a race car driver, and he organized a um, celebrity drag race. And I went out there thinking, you know, I'm just going to hop in a car and drive around the track. It's going to be really cool. Well, there was one female driver in the, in the circuit, and she wanted me to s drive her car in the worst way. And these cars are fitted to the driver. So, and you climb in through the window and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I'm five feet, eight inches tall. She was barely five feet. She wanted me to drive her car that was fitted to her body and wear her leather stuff. Well, I couldn't fire get... suit in the parlance. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't wear her pants. That was just out of the question. I finally kind of got into her jacket because it, it did have a little bit of give, and I could kind of drive like this. <laughs> but the worst thing was climbing into the car through the window. <laughs> And I'm like this, driving around the racetrack. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. And we got going, I, I, I'm sure it was at least 110 miles an hour. And I got back to the, to the end, and they clocked me at 36. <laughs> but it felt like 110. If you're doing 110 at Hawkeye Downs, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> The other thing that I got to do was uh, skydiving, and you know, I, everybody kept saying, why on earth would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? It's a good question. Well, Paul Phelan was with um, Rotary, and they were tr 
and they were trying to raise money for, I think it was, excuse me, I think it was Playgrounds. And um, so he went and talked to Lou Finch. Unbeknownst to me, Lou Finch had done skydiving before. And Lou challenged me to do skydiving. And I thought, well, geez, if Lou Finch can, you know, I didn't know that he had done it before. If, I said, if Lou Finch can do it, I can do it. Come on. So, and I'm terrified of heights. So we go out there, big crowd, everybody's there. He goes up first, jumps out of the plane, lands perfectly. I'm almost hyperventilating, feeling nauseated. Get in the plane, we go up, and between the time he dropped down to the ground and I got up there, big, huge cloud cover came over. So we had to cancel. Uh, I'm thinking. Uh, <laughs> we had to cancel. <laughs> well, we didn't. <laughs> we just had to postpone. Uh, so then, a few days later, we went out again and went up. And uh, really, I, I was almost sick. I was so scared. I have a death grip on the pilot's chair. And it was a tandem jump, so I was connected to somebody behind me. And I've got this <laughs> death grip on the chair. And he kept saying, let go of the chair. <laughs> let, let go of the chair. <laughs> I can't. And he kind of went like this, pried my hands up. And all of a sudden, we are out. And it was horrifying. It was loud, the wind and all this kind of stuff. It was just, I just was, I was like this the whole time. And then all of a sudden, the chute opened. And it was dead quiet. And it was beautiful. And we're going around in big circles. And it was just amazing. It was the most amazing experience ever. And we had a pinpoint landing, and it was just wonderful. But that was exciting. <laughs> Just a quick note, here's how you can tell that Lee is a former English teacher. She said nauseated instead of nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> Little pet peeve of mine, just so you know. Uh, she was right. Um, okay. Before we leave Nancy Evans, I want to talk, I want you to talk about your little ritual with her in City Hall when things got tough. Oh, well, you know. Being the only woman in the situation we were in, the, she was public safety commissioner, and that is a, a very male-dominated area. Firefighters, police officers, very male-oriented. And I found myself in many situations where I was, if not the only woman, one of maybe one or two women in many meetings. And it was frustrating because um, people still don't take women as seriously as they should, and they certainly didn't at that time. I can remember sitting in meetings and having uh, discussions about things, and you know, we're trying to find a solution to a problem, and I would say something, and it was like, whoosh, went right by everybody, right over their heads. And about three minutes later, some guy down here would say exactly the same thing in exactly the same words, and everybody would go, great idea, let's do it. And I just thought, okay, I don't care who gets the credit as long as we do it. <laughs> so it was, but it was very frustrating, and there were times that, that it felt extremely lonely. And there were times when it was just downright disheartening. And Nancy and I would go up into the bowels of City Hall on one of the back stairs where nobody ever went, and we'd just have a little cry to ourselves. <laughs> and, it, and it just felt really good to know that there was one other person who sort of understood what it was like. Because being, while being mayor was absolutely, without a doubt in my mind, the best job I ever had the most amazing to be able to um, to be able to leverage a title to do things in a community is remarkable and amazing and fun and uh, so it was the best job that I ever had and it was also in some cases the worst job the hardest job the criticism was not quite as bad as it is today 
But it was still there. It was still there. And you know, you would get criticized for things that you thought, how could people not think this was a really good idea for the community, you know? And so that those, <coughs> those times were, were hard. That seems like a good segue into this. Uh, you know, usually my job here is to provide a little light comic relief, but I want to be very serious for a moment. Lee Clancy is a civil rights hero in this community, and I'd like her to talk a little bit. I'd like you to talk a little bit about housing discrimination in Cedar Rapids. Mm, okay. Um, I think it was, um, I think about 2001. Um, you know, we'd gone through all kinds of stuff, Y2K, and you know, we, we had very, very serious things that were going on in the community. One of which was um, uh, there was a, a new ordinance brought forward for the Civil Rights Commission to include sexual orientation in the housing ordinance. So you could not discriminate based on sexual orientation. And um, I honestly didn't feel strongly one way or another. So, I mean, just kind of think about 2001, we didn't have gay marriage, we didn't have, you know, almost anything with regard to sexual orientation. And uh, as, a, as a result of this ordinance going through, we had to have three public hearings um, a week apart. And we knew that it was going to attract cr a crowd of people. So we had them at uh, Jefferson, Washington, and Kennedy, so that we could accommodate whoever wanted to come and speak. And we set it up so that the um, microphones, w there were two microphones, and people had to come down to the microphones to speak. They had to say their names. We gave them, I think, three minutes to talk. And um, it was during those public hearings that, and, and by the way, they, they were conducted in, a, in an extraordinarily civil fashion because the council decided ahead of time that we were not going to allow people to just go off on a rant. And so we had expectations and let people know what our expectations were about how they were to conduct their comments. And, um, and as a result, it was relatively civil. But I have to tell you, I heard some things over the course of those three weeks that I had never heard in my life, and they were really ugly really, really ugly. And we're just talking about housing. We weren't talking about marriage. We weren't talking about, uh, you know, it was just housing. <laughs> and I was so appalled that when it came time to vote, the vote was two to two. And I had to break the tie vote. And there was no question how I was going to vote by the end of the uh, public hearings. And I voted in favor of adding that to the, to the Civil Rights uh, Commission Code ordinance. However, it had enormous blowback. And um, the next year, um, I, they, I was up for my th fourth re-election, my third re-election, first election, third re-election. And that came back to roost. And uh, so both Nancy and I um, and Dale Todd were what we, friendly, a friendly way of putting it is we were fired in public. <laughs> we were not reelected. And um, it, it broke my heart, it broke Nancy's heart, it broke Dale Todd's heart. Bless Dale Todd, he kept with it. He uh, is back on the council right now. He was, um, they were all extraordinary in terms of what they were able to do. The things that we got done during the six years that I was mayor, uh, had, we had done, we did more, I think, than most councils had ever done. Um, in terms of all kinds of things, personnel issues, technology issues, um, uh, building. The History Center was one of the things that the city helped when they moved into the old um, Rapid Chevrolet building. Um, African American Museum and Library, the the, um, uh, the the ice facility, the we redid the baseball stadium. 
And then we did all kinds of things with regard to economic development. We had a huge economic development team and my former economic development director, Jim Halverson, is right here. He was the youngest person that had ever been hired as a director and I hired him because I just knew he was going to be great and he was. And um, we had a, a whole system for economic development where everybody involved with economic development had to meet once a week. And we didn't let anything th fall through cracks. It, we had economic development going gangbusters, just unbelievable. And um, I don't know if you remember the big McLeod project that went in on uh, the, the west side, southwest side. We got them through every single uh, permitting, zoning, everything in about six weeks. It had never been done like that before. And um, it was really extraordinary. So we had a lot of new things in place, multi-year union contracts, you know, all that kind of stuff that had never been done before. And um, my successor came in and sort of shut that down the day after you walked in and it just stopped economic development cold. So it was, it was really hard. I didn't know if, whether I wanted to stay in Cedar Rapids after that. It was very, very hard because I would run into people everywhere I went and they would say, oh, I wish you were still mayor. And I'd say, yeah, I wish I was too. <laughs> <laughs> and I um, went home and you know, I, I went on and lived with my mom in Florida for about a month and then I went away and did traveling and then, you know, and I really kept saying to Jay, I, I don't know if I can live here anymore. And he said, you know what, we'll go wherever you want, but we gotta, you can't make that decision for a year. And he was absolutely right. It, you know, it's one of those traumatic things that... Jay you, seemed surprised that he that was you, right. <laughs> <laughs> that you just have to get through. So. Was there a tape? There is a tape, we're recording. <laughs> First. And only. And only. I like that. So before we leave your mayoral career, I want to talk about two more things. One, you mentioned Y2K. I'd like to have you tell the assembled crowd what it was like to get the city ready for that enormous event, Y2K. And then also uh, your experience uh, with uh, Al Gore. Not with him, but about him. <laughs> well, it could have been with him. It could have been with him. Um, yeah, well, nobody knew it was going to happen when, when the year turned, when the century turned, and we were all just absolutely bound and determined that we were going to do every, every possible thing that we could to prepare the city for a catastrophe, because we just didn't know if one might occur or not. We had emergency management set up. We um, had a huge uh, uh, screen set up in the um, council chambers. We had all these alternative backup systems that were in place because we just didn't know. Nobody knew. And um, all of us stayed up. We brought, had dinner in. All we had our department heads in. Everybody was on, on board. I mean, they had to be <laughs> available because, you know, if everything went to hell in a handbasket, we had to have people there. And so we were there right up until midnight, <laughs> midnight comes and goes, nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> it was the most anticlimactic thing I have ever had to do. I mean, we worked for six months getting ready, the city ready, six months. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, with backup systems and everybody was just absolutely prepared. And then just nothing. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Um, okay, so Al Gore, which was probably the other reason I wasn't reelected. <laughs> um, uh, he uh, was he ran against George W. Bush, and um, I had I had become pretty good friends with uh, Senator Harkin and Governor Vilsack because I. I was working hard to get money in for the community. We were working on brownfield grants um, that Senator Harkin helped get uh, helped us get about three million dollars for brownfield grants, which, by the way, 
took down the Iowa Steel and Iowa Iron Building on either side of 12th Avenue, and look how beautiful that is now. It took a long time. It's you know you have to look out. You have to you have to take the long view on some of this stuff. But we got Sinclair cleaned up. So I I've become very good friends with these gentlemen, and um, they obviously were in support of Al Gore. Now my position was nonpartisan. And I tried really hard to keep it nonpartisan until then. <laughs> and they, all three of them, came in and they're standing around me. I couldn't see a thing beyond them. They're just all this maleness. You, ha you have to endorse Al Gore. You must endorse Al Gore. We have to have your endorsement. He's got to know that you are for him. I said, I'm a nonpartisan mayor. I don't endorse. You must do this. <laughs> and I finally succumbed, and I endorsed Al Gore, and it obviously was to my detriment in the long run, because that was one of, I think, one of the reasons that I was not reelected to. So. You know, I'm going to do one more before we leave your mayoral career, because you were talking about the anti-climax of Y2K, and it reminded me that you were also mayor on 9-11. Mm -hmm. To talk a little bit about what that meant for the, the city and It was a position. Tuesday, and it was in the, obviously in the morning. I'm getting ready. We had a TV, and I'm watching the news, and I saw the first plane hit the, hit the tower, and I thought, well, that is the strangest thing I've ever seen. It was just bizarre. And I didn't think much else about it, because it was New York, for heaven's sake. And then, all of a sudden, the second plane went in. And my first thought was, that was deliberate and we're being attacked. And sure enough, it was. And I immediately left, went downtown, told all non-essential personnel to go home, because we didn't know what that meant. We didn't know if it meant they were going to attack everybody, if that was just the only thing. Who knew? So we sent all non-essential pers personnel home, uh, put everybody else on high alert. I started calling our biggest businesses in town, Rockwell, Agon, now Transamerica, um, uh, just to, to let them know they needed to be aware that this had happened, uh, take some precautions themselves. Um, and that was a scary thing. Now, as it turned out, it was just just. That's a terrible thing to say. It was, it was uh, the Twin Towers and nothing else, thank heaven. Um, but that was a very scary thing. That was, uh, that was one of those adrenaline rush things. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to get this on tape just one more time. So Jay was right that you needed to stay in town <laughs> for one year after the, the mayoral change. Jay was change. right, yes. uh, Tell us what was next for you. Um, well, I uh, I did some business uh, I biz did some business training and consulting. I worked for a small uh, company as vice president for uh, customer service that did training for banks, and then um, I became president CEO of the chamber, and that was also a wonderful experience. It was back to my community orientation. I just I love working in the community. I love uh, volunteering, and and um, it. It meant it was a little bit smaller than the whole city because it was business instead of everybody. But it was really a wonderful, wonderful experience. And um, uh, toward the end of that experience was when we had the 2008 flood. And um, the chamber was incredibly, they were an incredible team and they were incredibly wonderful about coming up with a couple of ideas that I think were essential to getting so many businesses back up and running. The first was to put together a, um, a grant uh, fund and, and loan fund. Uh, we raised about three million dollars and the city kicked in another three million and we ended up just giving tw up to $25,000 grants and loans, low interest loans to businesses that had been impacted by the flood some of which were small businesses in people's homes. So not only they lost their business, but they lost their home as well. And people would come in and they would get their checks and they would just burst into tears. I mean, it was, it was the most amazing thing that I ever was a part of to be able to help people 
get their business back. The second thing was an adopt a business program where businesses that had not been impacted by the flood could adopt businesses that had and they then, could, uh, they, between the two businesses, they could decide whatever they wanted to do to help. They could give them money, they could provide employees, they could provide technology, they could provide space, they could, um, you know, lead them through how to get through a disaster. I mean, it, it, was, it was extraordinary how well it worked in terms of getting these businesses back up and running. They say, and I'm, I don't know if I've got these uh, percentages exactly right, but they say in a big disaster like that, of, of all the businesses that are impacted, only about 50% will come back. And of that 50%, another 50% will die in the second year. In the first year, only 50% will come back. In the second year, another 50% will go away. So that means 25% of your businesses are going to be lost. And because of, of the loan fund, grant fund, and because of the Adopt a Business program, we had, I think, close to 80% that came back. And um, the other thing that we did was the weekend after the flood, the flood happened on uh, Thursday, I think, Thursday. And Saturday, we organized to allow business owners to go through the parkade, the First Avenue Parkade, First Avenue Parkade, wherever we are, <laughs> and across the uh, skyways into dark buildings. There was no electricity. Uh, so they had, to, if they were in a high rise, they had to go upstairs to get essential business equipment. So computers, files, whatever they had to do. People were coming out uh, with rolling suitcases, uh, you know, office chairs on wheels. It was, it was unbelievable. So that was Saturday. By Sunday, all these other people had heard that we were letting them do this, and so they wanted to get, do it too. Well, the fire department was having a fit because you know, we didn't know whether or not there were gas leaks and everything. So they then organized it. We had signs up in the, in the uh, uh, parking lot, in the parking garage, you know, uh, this building, if, you, if you're in this building, stand here. If you're in this building, stand here. And they were each assigned a firefighter, and the firefighter would lead them into the buildings and make sure that they all got back out, because we were not we weren't doing that. <laughs> Shame on us. But it meant that people could get back up and running with their business by the next Monday. And they couldn't get into those buildings for weeks. So it was really essential that that happened. And it was, it was, it was sad, but it, it worked. So let's, you've continued to be involved in politics in a couple of ways. One is, uh, were involved in the switch, the change of governmental systems here in town, and you're also involved in the 5015 in 2020 organization. You want to talk about either or both of those things? Well, um, after we went out of office and my successor came in, things sort of went back to the old ways and things weren't getting done. And there was a call for a change in the form of government. And they um, formed a, um, I've lost the name of it, uh, the committee to take a look at the sure. former government and make a recommendation. And I was asked to serve on it. And, uh, and we came up with the uh, council mayor, I mean, the council manager formed the government for people to vote on. <coughs> wasn't particularly my choice. I, I liked the idea of a strong mayor rather than a council manager, but I think for our community has been a really good change. And um, we've had a super manager for the last few years who has done an enormous amount of good works for our community. So I think it, it was it turned out to be a good choice. Uh, 5050 in 2020 was is a state is still a statewide effort to increase the number of women in elected positions, and it means 50% of the uh, people in elected positions at the state and local levels by 2020 will be women. And I don't think we're going to make that, but you know, we've got a woman governor, and we've got a woman senator, and, um, and a woman, women congressmen, and congresswomen. So um, we're on our way. Uh, but it was an effort to train women to run for public office. 
Well, and I, I think that, so let me cycle all the way back to when you decided to jump into your first mayoral race. You jumped in so late that you had to do the petition really quickly. You had to talk people into giving money who had maybe already given out what they intended to give. Right. Uh, what would such a training program have meant to you at the time? What lessons have you taken forward from that and offered to others? Oh, um, don't do it as late as I did. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it was really tough because people had made a commitment already to uh, the candidates, and um, so that first round, that first time I ran for election, boy, I, I don't think we spent more than about nine thousand dollars, which is unbelievable. Um, it, uh, you have to be prepared for the unexpected and. To and for your character to be questioned, uh, you know, people say, "Well, you must have really thick skin." No, but I don't. I just don't let it stick with me. Or I run up in the back of the city hall someplace and cry. But I just you can't. You can't let that stick with you because it's just too hard. Well, and it would be fair to say that women candidates are often subjected to certain kinds of judgment that their male peers are not around issues of appearance and clothing and those sorts of things, the tenor of their voice. That's right. You yeah. encountered any of that? Yes, I did. Yes, she did. <laughs> she did. Yes, she did. Yeah. And children's books and yeah. nouns of assembly. I had to get down some assembly are one of my favorite things. So let's talk about your children a little bit. Um, well, one of the things that I had wanted to do after I went out of office is to uh, write a children's book. My, sis my youngest sister is a working artist, and um, I always wanted to do something with her. And so we uh, collaborated on a children's book called A Bale of Turtles, and it's about nouns of assembly. A noun of assembly is. Um, what you call a group of a certain kind of animal or bird. So a gaggle of geese, you know, a trip of ponies, um, that sort of thing. And um, I wrote the prose, actually it's that sort of a poem. I wrote the uh, words and then I would send them to my sister and say, this is what I want on this page. And then she just gave her free reign to do whatever she wanted to do and she did the most extraordinary, exquisite, beautiful, whimsical uh, paintings and that, that we turned into a book. But, you know, won't be any of you who think self-publishing is the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I know a thing or two about that. Right. Right. It is, it's expensive. Um, it, it, you don't get the marketing help that you think that you will when you pay for all this stuff. The books end up being much more expensive than the competition books because they are printed on demand as opposed to printing 5,000 of them at a time. Um, and so, you know, if you, you sell them to all your friends and family and then you're kind of done. <laughs> but, it's, but, it's, but it's a charming book and it was a, it was a good learning experience. And um, I have a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want one, you should negotiate with her because the prices for her books are on Amazon right now in the secondary market. They're really high. And she won't see any of that if you pay $50 for a book. They are. They really are. Seriously? Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, ma'am, they are. All right. Questions for Lee Clinton's I don't have a question, but I remember the day in Green Square when you came out and said and that there's a yeah. the whole park is electric. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it didn't work out for anybody. <laughs> it was a very nice day. <laughs> it was a gorgeous day, sunny yeah. summer morning. It was wonderful. Yes, I, 
mean, not so much a question, but just a, a big thank you for all of you contributed to this to this community and, and the betterment. Of thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us about visiting the White House? I mean, most of us probably haven't been there, but I know that you have. So, is there an Thanks. interesting story about that? Yeah, it was really, really fun. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, we have this wonderful other museum in town called the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library. And um, Václav Havel was being hosted by Bill and Hillary Clinton for a state dinner. And I'll be darned if we didn't get an invitation to go. And I thought, what the heck? Yeah! <laughs> So um, we ended up going to the White House for dinner, Jay and I, and you know we had to drive up. We were greeted by Marine Corps. What was it? What was she? She was a major. She was our escort. She escorted us all the way through the White House. We're going up to the reception room. Oh, it's just so amazing! I couldn't believe it. And um, we then just kind of stood around like. Bumpkins from Iowa because we didn't know anybody, but um, we ended up uh, walking over and talking to a very lovely couple. He was in full dress uniform, and um, they we were just talking about our kids and talking about this and talking about that. And so I said, you know, so what is it that you do in the military? And his wife, I thought, was going to die laughing, and she, he said. Oh, well, I'm chairman of the Ch Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, we I mean, go into the, the White House dining room. It's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, every table is set right. These beautiful, big flowers, candles, all that kind of stuff. And I thought we were going to be sitting together, and um, we walk in, uh, the tables are set for, I think, eight or ten each, and uh, we got our table assignments, and they're different. And so I just said, okay, I guess I'll see you later. <laughs> and I start making my way over to, this woman was pointing at my table, over to the table, and there was this man in my way. And he had his back to me. And I no and I recognized him. It was Stevie Wonder. And so I said, excuse me, Mr. Wonder. <laughs> he turned around, oh baby, you don't call me Mr. Wonder, I'm Stevie. And I went, okay. <laughs> he was the entertainment for the <laughs> That was Lou Rawls, right? And I look at uh, they have these beautiful place cards, everything's printed, you know, the, the menu card, everything is just unbelievable. And over here is Kurt Vonnegut, and over here is, um, oh, stop, I've lost it. Um, Secretary of State, German. Henry. Henry Kissinger. Um, and directly across from me is Bill Clinton. Oh. And Vaclav Havel's wife. Oh. And I almost didn't know what to say. I mean, it was, I was so overwhelmed. I had met Bill Clinton several times through the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He always had the mayors into the White House for, you know, a little talk. And I had met him several times. He is pretty, however, however you feel about him, he is extraordinary. He looks at you. When he is talking to you, you think you're the only person on the planet. He just, and he knows everybody in the room. It's unbelievable. He has a photographic memory or something. And he went around the table and said, I want everybody to introduce themselves. And we're going to, you know, I want everybody to have, to start a conversation you know, with somebody else. And we're going to take the menu card. And you're going to sign your name, then you're going to pass it to the left and oh, get this one, sign this one, pass it. So I ended up with a menu card with everybody's signatures on it. Oh, oh, 
<laughs> and um, it was an extraordinary, unique evening. Then, then uh, we, the, Lou Reed came on, he played, then we went out in the Marine Corps band, we danced. It was, it was just life, it was unique in my life. Okay, I have two related questions. First, what in the world did Kurt Vonnegut Jr. say to Henry Kissinger? <laughs> because they will not be pals. You know what he said? So it goes. Uh, it was probably what he said. You know, it was, it was really, the whole conversation was a surreal. It was very, it was very cordial, it was very civil, it was, everybody was chatting with everybody else. It was, there wasn't anything of huge substance, mm -hmm. but it was uh, a dinner conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. Lee, um, I don't think I've ever said this to you, but it was it was rather pivotal pivotal in my life. Um, years and years ago, um, you were addressing a group of junior league women about an issue that was pressing on your heart. And um, you were very passionate about it. And someone said, well, why should we do this? And I have quoted this so many times. And I think that everyone here will recognize it from the stories that you've told. You said, because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, it was, um, we were, <laughs> we had, uh, Junior League, by and large, is pretty, white organization, for lack of a better way to describe it. And we were trying very hard to diversify and, and, and be more inviting and inclusive. And we had uh, just brought in our first African-American woman, and she was just delightful. We were moving the office, and uh, it was going to be moved right down in the Colonial Building on 2nd Avenue. And, um, they had a great, we had a great rent, we had, you know, it was great storage, great space, it was going to be perfect parking, you know, all the, all the good things. And we were doing a vote of the, of the members. And so I presented all of the facts about this piece of property that we were thinking about renting. And one woman stood up and she said, I could never go down there into that neighborhood. I, I'm too afraid to go down in that neighborhood. I would never do that. I, I don't know why you would want to have a have a, 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 a you know an office there. And with that, this African American woman stood up and she said, "That's my neighborhood. I live a block away. We never saw her again." And but. But it, I said, you know, people said, well, why, why would you push that? I said, because, first of all, it was to our advantage. I mean, it was a great spot, fabulous space. There was nothing scary about it, and that was wrong. I mean, that comment was wrong. So. A last question from y'all. All right, then I have one, and that is, if you could give the younger Lee Clancy advice. What advice would you give? Are you single? <laughs> 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 We're on our 49th year, Larry. I love, I love my husband. And he is, he is, a, he is my partner and my friend, and I just am crazy about him. Um, I'm glad he's put up with me all these years. Uh, uh, honestly, I, I did things because I wanted to do them, um, I took a lot of risks. I think taking risks is a very important thing to do. Calculated risks, but risks nonetheless. Uh, don't, I, I, I never was complacent. Um, I don't know that I would give myself a lot of advice because I was kind of doing it by the seat of my pants and doing the things I wanted to do. I, I have led what I consider a very special wonderful life. I've had terrific experiences, both professional and volunteer, family and friends. This has truly become our home. Uh, it, I don't know how to say it any better than that. Uh, I just have been very, 
very lucky. Well, with that, I would say this community has been very, very lucky to have your service.